everyone. Thank you for clicking on my video. Thank you for being here. Care Collab of the general care of cymbidiums, which is quite a broad subject, depending on what kind of cymbidium you have. I appreciate your time. I appreciate that you're interested in hearing what I have to say about my very, very commercial hybrid Cymbidium that I got in a garden center without a label. This is one of the mass produced ones. You can get species, you can get variegated ones, you can get some that are warmer growers than mine is. You can get some that are from China that have a total different kind of a care requirement because simply of getting them to bloom you can get fragrant ones, etc. Mine is none of that. It is not a fancy one. It's a general one that I got off the rescue table simply because I saw a new root growing and I thought, you know what? I can grow some bidiums outdoors here in southern Spain where I'm at. So she is not going to be a space issue when it comes to winter. New roots, didn't know the color of the blooms. I was very happy when she did bloom because I gave mine the name Beach Balls. As you can see, mine is still not in bloom. I've still got spikes and buds and it can be another two weeks before these bloom out. We still don't see the beach ball effect where she gets her name from. I'll put up some pictures from past years where this was starting to take shape and then I'll show you some of her blooms. Mine is not fragrant, but you can get fragrant cymbidiums. Some species do have some amazing fragrances and these blooms can be so big, so blousy, so beautiful that the fragrance is quite intense. Personally, I've never experienced it, but if you're looking for a fragrant cymbidium, then make sure you get a very, very good primary hybrid with two fragrant parents or you get yourself a species. Now, as I mentioned before, I got myself this Cymbidium simply because I saw new roots coming and I knew that I grow in Lekka and self-watering. This is going to be an easy transition when you get new roots on any orchid and you want to transition into a different kind of media. It is the best timing to do so. I don't have footage of when I potted her up because I didn't have my YouTube channel up and running at the time. But as you can see, she settled in very, very nicely very, very quickly. Cymbidiums are vigorous orchids. A transition into Lekka and self-watering was a no-brainer for me simply because of her growth habit. The roots are very fleshy, very chunky, and my climate is very, very dry. It's hot for about seven months of the year with very low humidity. And in order to keep up with the vigor of an orchid like this Cymbidium, I wanted something that was easy care, set it and forget it type of care. And that is what I can do with my Cymbidium here. I literally put her into this pot, which is a 40 centimeter pot, even while she was relatively small. Now, when it comes to Cymbidiums, we also hear they like to be pot bound. They love to be snug in their pot. So when you see the growth habit and the age of my Cymbidium from the center moving outwards, you can see how long the Cymbidium has been in this pot. And you can see how oversized the pot was when I potted her up. But that's the beauty of inorganic growing. I don't have to consider the media breaking down. I can literally just set it and forget it. And because she is in a self-watering setup, she is a very, very thirsty orchid. This helps me with my watering. Because of her high requirements for humidity around her leaves, the setup itself doesn't do enough work because I have super hot, dry winds, I have humidity of an average of about 30% all year round, and that is not good for the leaves. So unfortunately, even the setup of Lekka and self-watering, despite helping me keep up with her needs, will not protect her from the hot, dry winds that I get during the summer months. And that makes my leaves always look untidy. They're looking great now because she is absolutely in her element. Eventually, they will start to look like this. The tips will burn because of my lack of humidity. So if you have leaf tip burn on a cymbidium, more often than not, it is not a question of too much fertilizer. It's a question of low humidity. So I'm actually quite pleased that at this time of year, I'm able to do this care collab because she looks quite presentable. I do have a leaf dying back on one of the older growths and that is normal. Other than that, 
she is looking really well at this point in time. When it comes to seeing her in July and August, that is not going to be the case because right now she's getting plenty of light. She's on a south facing side of the hedge and the angle of the sun is so low that she doesn't get direct sun. When it comes to June, July, August and September, that all changes. So on top of the lack of humidity, the sun angle is so high She's pretty much in full sun all day in a very breezy area. Her chair there is pretty permanent because I don't know where else to put her. At least here she gets some airflow. She gets a little bit protection because of the cooling of the hedge that adds to her little climate. Still, with the hot dry winds, with the sun beating down on her, her leaves very, very quickly start to deteriorate and dry up like the one on the left there. So when it comes to temperatures, I can leave her outside all year round, which is awesome seeing as she just gets bigger and bigger. And mine is not even a big cymbidium. I would call this medium size. You see the temperatures that I have here, my lowest ever I've experienced is five degrees Celsius. The highest can go anywhere to 40 degrees and up plus the hot dry winds. You can see where my problems arise. So this cymbidium is pretty, pretty tough going, and she does bloom for me every year. With regards to fertilizing, this is the first year that I only have three spikes because last year I was rather neglectful when it came to fertilizing her. I had some issues with my water supply and I don't want to be pumping in so much of my tap water into my orchids because it seems to be toxic. And that is why I was very, very cautious with fertilizing this orchid during the summer months because I wanted to avoid any mineral buildup on my LECA. And I didn't know how quickly I could replace the RO water. So once I fertilized her, she would be growing much more vigorous and that would mean more fertilizer and more water. So I was very, very conservative in the summer of 2021 because of my water supply. She is that thirsty. The size of her reservoir is large enough, but when she starts to go into active growth, that reservoir empties within three days. So last year, I fertilized her at 300 parts per million, but probably every two weeks, as opposed to what I would normally do every time I water her and refresh her reservoir. So her fertilizer was way reduced. Normally 300 parts per million, in active growth. Also now while she's in spike every three days when her reservoir is absorbed. That didn't happen, but I still get three spikes this year and I'm just grateful for the fact that she's still around. I was not expecting anything out of her this year. So this is, this is good, but yeah, she's hungry and she's thirsty. And I only stop fertilizing after she's finished blooming because at that point in time, there's no new growths coming, not on mine. And I'm gonna put a disclaimer on that because orchids do surprise us and I already have a new growth starting on the growth that doesn't have a spike. So 300 parts per million, we're gonna continue with that just to be able to encourage that one new growth. I'm not gonna make any distinction and wait on the other ones. I very, very rarely flush this orchid because if I wanted to go up in fertilizer, I would probably get away with 500 parts per million. I don't do that. Everybody gets the same. I go from 100 to 160 to 300. But because of the fact that she is such a drinker, she gets more than 300 per week. So that cancels that out. So I very rarely flush her. There is no need. I've never seen mineral buildup on this orchid. She's been in this pot since I got her in 2018. She can stay in this pot for at least another two years. There's plenty of room in the pot. I placed her in the middle because of how she grows in a circle. And I do dread the repotting. But the good part about these cymbidiums is that the propagation is super, super simple. If I were to then take her out of the pot and want to propagate her, I could take her bulb by bulb and each bulb would produce a new growth as long as it is a healthy bulb. Or I could just split her in half and have a back end and a front end. But we shall see. Right now, I am happy that I can leave that for about two more years at least. And I'm gonna need some help to get her out of this pot. She is totally pot bound and the pot itself now weighs approximately 12 kilos. 
It is also said that when it comes to preserving the energy of a cymbidium, I got this tip from Lynn Brooks last year, that it is a good idea to remove the spikes while they're still in bloom, but just on the edge of going over because that will encourage new growth to kick in much, much faster. Proof is in the pudding because of the fact that here, no spike and a new growth is already on the way. So this year I will be prematurely taking the spikes off. I will of course enjoy them to their maximum, but cymbidium blooms make great vase blooms as well. So that's what I will do. Just take them off a little bit prematurely and then see if I can baby the new growth through the spring, which is a little bit cooler where she will still be in the shade so that they get hardened off a little bit before it really, really gets hot. Hopefully this way I will avoid toasting the new leaves. We shall see, but that is a tip I got from Lynn Brooks, who's also taking part in this care collab, and then we'll have a look-see what happens throughout the summer. And if you're wondering why your cymbidium won't bloom, usually the rule of thumb is it's not getting enough of a temperature drop. So if you have a cymbidium and it's growing well for you, consider giving it a radical temperature drop. They can go up to freezing, even if for a short period of time, but they can really tolerate some cold, cold temperatures and that will trigger the spikes. I don't have a problem with that here in my climate. My climate does all the work for me. I just have to make sure I keep her happy and well watered and fertilized. Pests can be a problem sometimes here. I have to watch for mealybugs, but all my buds are clean so far but she now does get regular checkups. I keep an eye on them. I don't have any ant issues. No aphids are coming at this point in time. It can only be the odd mealy bug here and there, which I have to sometimes discourage from my hospitality, <laughs> to put it mildly. So I hope that my little video was of some help to you. If you've got yourself something commercial and you're not quite sure what to do with it, know that I consider this fuss free and a pleasure to have around without having to be too worried about an orchid, especially when it comes to winter. A lot of my collection is much, much more finicky with my temperatures. This one isn't and I love her for it. Thank you so very, very much for watching my video. If there's something I didn't cover and something that you want to hear a little bit more about, ask away in the comments or just say hi and let me know that you were here. If I didn't circle back on a thought, you know, the comments are there for a reason. Thank you for your time. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you to everyone that's participating in the Care Collab. The links to their videos will be in the description below. Some have much bigger collections with more to see for sure. So I encourage you, have a look-see at the channels that are linked in the description. Your time is very much appreciated. I wish you a beautiful, beautiful day. One condition though, that you stay safe. Take care, bye.